Hi folks, so we're going to talk a little bit about glycolytic control and how glycolysis, which is this pathway here, is regulated. Now, glycolysis is really two different pathways that are connected and they run all the time. And if you're trying to just break down glucose, sure, glycolysis includes both of them because these are some prep steps. But these are not dedicated to glycolysis yet. They can go off and do other things um, such as stores glycogen or undergo the pentose phosphate pathway. And so these are not technically considered a key part of glycolysis. They can be used for other things. F16BP is the first committed intermediate to glycolysis and it has to kind of finish. And so we have the HMP pathway and we have the glycolysis gluconeogenesis part of the pathway. Now if you notice, each one of these has a, what's called a flux control point. at the beginning and at the end. Right? So the HMP pathway has a flux control at the beginning and at the end, and glycolysis has a flux control beginning at the beginning and at the end. So those are the places where we see regulation happening. Now the first one we're going to talk about here is the cell autonomous control. Now if you look at that word cell autonomous That, this is how our cells control glycolysis kind of in their own little world. The cell is kind of responding to its own cues, and it's doing its own stuff and keeping glycolysis in control on its own without having to think about anything else. So first thing we want to remember is one of the key things that glycolysis is used for is to make ATP, and we come out with 2 net ATP and 2 NADH per glucose. So the first thing you kind of want to think about is energetics control. If you have a lot of ATP, you probably don't need to run glycolysis so much. And so ATP represses the intake and the outtake of glycolysis only. It doesn't affect anything about the hexose monophosphate pool. All it does is shut off the inflow and the outflow of glycolysis. So that means that stuff can't just flow through anymore. This is off and this is off. Stuff has to back out the other direction if you want it to run. And so if you have a lot of ATP, that means that the net flux in glycolysis is actually going to go the other way. It's going to be a gluconeogenetic flux. So it's going to be coming back out. Okay, Because we got ATP, we don't need to run glycolysis. Let's just go back it out here. Right? Now when I say that these, these flux control points are repressed, it's for PFK1 and for pyruvate kinase, which are the forward direction enzymes for this if you want to go backwards, you'll have to do a couple of steps to get around pyruvate kinase, and you'll have to use fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase to, do, uh, to undo PFK1. So those are different enzymes. That's how we get through these flux controls, is by having different enzymes on either side. Now, if we're in the opposite condition, if we have no or little ATP, or we're starting to actively uh, metabolize, we're going to want to turn on these flux control points. So ADP is an obvious way to turn these things on. If you have ADP, that means you're burning ATP, and that means you should probably make more. Um, but our bodies usually will have a little bit better control uh, than that. And that's because, you know, even sitting on your couch or doing a screencast or doing your homework, you're going to be burning ATP into ADP, and you don't need to kick your uh, glycolysis into super overdrive. And if you're doing that, then you're probably doing something wrong. Um, but if you're running a sprint, like you're taking off, you start out with a lot of ATP, and suddenly you're running into ADP pretty fast. And so your body can use an enzyme called adenylate kinase to take two ADPs and make one ATP and one AMP out of that. So you're getting an ATP back, but you're also building up AMP. And if you're doing this, if you're doing this bottom reaction, that means that you are actively metabolizing quickly. You need ATP a lot, and so AMP is going to build up. Uh, and so AMP is actually the best way to turn on these guys. It'll actually de-inhibit these places. It'll undo what ATP is doing for the inhib inhibition of the flux control points, and it'll turn it on even better. And that's because, you know, at the beginning of a race, you're going to have a lot of ATP, but you're also going to start building up AMP. And AMP can jump up tenfold for every halving of ATP, just because AMP is just not around very much. And so even if this thing is repressed by ATP, if AMP is made suddenly everything's going to turn on and everything's going to flow right through glycolysis. So that's pretty easy. So that's the energetic level of control. 
Now there's also some uh, intermediate controls here. Um, the most easy way to think about uh, the basic level of control is, for example, up here. Glucose 6-phosphate is going to repress hexokinase. And that's kind of like when you're filling up your car at the gas station. You know, you fill your tank up. Once the HMP, the hexose monophosphate pool, fills up, uh, you need to stop the intake. So it's just like the handle on the gas pump. So once it fills up, it's going to cut itself off. So G6P is going to build up. If this pool is full, that means that we need to shut off hexokinase and stop bringing stuff in because we don't have any what, anything to do with it. We don't have anywhere to put it anymore. So that's a basic one. That's going to be a competitive inhibition, which is going to cause our KM to go up, and it's going to cause glucose to have a lower affinity for hexokinase, uh, and it's going to take in less and less as the more the repression goes up. Okay. Other ways we want to think about this is, for example, F16BP. If this is building up, we need to communicate to the end of the pathway that we have a lot of stuff coming down the pipe here. You should probably start getting ready for it because in a few reactions, you're going to have a big slug of PEP to get through, and you better speed up now or you're never going to catch up. So if F16BP builds up, it's going to come down here and turn on pyruvate kinase. That just keeps the both sides communicating with each other. The other thing you might want to do is if you start to build up stuff down here and it's backing up your pipes, you're going to want to shut off the inflow so that you don't pile up a huge pile of PEP at the end. Uh, instead, you can shut off the intake until you catch up. Once, you know, if PEP is building up, that means pyruvate isn't going anywhere. Uh, and we should probably be handling that uh, and kind of slowing down before so we can catch up with pyruvate. Uh, pyruvate might go down, and then PEP will go through, and then this will go down, and then we can start glycolysis again. So if PEP builds up, you need to shut off the intake. If F16PP is building up, that means you need to speed up the outflow, otherwise we're going to back up again. So it's a lot kind of like dealing with plumbing, right? If you, you, once you see that there's a uh, backup in your plumbing line, you don't want to be flushing the toilet very much because it's going to back you up more. Um, and likewise, if you know something go big is going through, you better be sure the line's clear so that you don't get backed up. So... That's cell autonomous control. PEP represses PFK1, F16BP turns on pyruvate kinase, ATP represses both sides, and AMP de-inhibits uh, and activates both sides. And ADP can kind of help activate too. And the last one is glucose 6-phosphate, which just acts to shut off the intake. Now the reason this is important is because regulation of these flux control points can really change the behavior of different kinds of tissues. And so, for example, uh, here's our exose monophosphate pool. We have glucose 1-phosphate, glucose 6-phosphate, and fructose 6-phosphate. Those are all used in different places. It can be used for glycolysis. It can be used for glycogen. All those things rise and fall at the same rate. And so if you bring in a bunch of glucose, it's going to probably be stored a little bit. It's going to be used a little bit. Um, and so, you know, these things all take out of the same feed, uh, the same kind of feedstock. But if you don't want to be always taking in glucose, you should be shutting this stuff off so it doesn't get stored when you don't want it to. And so again, let's think about our controls. F16 favors pyruvate kinase. PEP represses uh, PFK1. Okay. And again, that's uh, PFK1 specifically, not uh, FBPS1. FBPS1 is what undoes. Uh, PFK, and we'll talk about that when we talk about gluconeogenesis. And so we also know about ATP. And AMP, ADP. And so those things, that's the main level of cell autonomous control, and of course we can repress hexokinase with G6P, just so we shut off the influx to the tank. So this thing can be going on hunky-dory inside of a cell. Everything's going great. Um, but suddenly, you know, around the corner, this evil clown comes or something scary happens. And so you need to respond quickly. You know, you got to run away. So, for example, in your muscles, adrenaline triggers a change in glycolysis. And so adrenaline is going to kick on and it's going to... Um, specifically interact with this other enzyme called PFK2. It's the enzyme that puts a phosphate on the 2 position of fructose 6-phosphate. So we end up with fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. The only reason that this thing exists is to 
serve as a mega override for PFK1. Now, all it does is hugely increase PFK1 activity. It's the master override switch from your hormones and your endocrine system. So if PFK1 is made, then you're going to, or PFK1 is activated, you're going to turn on glycolysis. You're going to build up F1.6, and that's going to turn on PEP, and you're going to just flow through this thing like crazy. Okay? 2.6 is a huge and very potent activator of PFK1. And the only way you can make that is by activating PFK2 or deactivating the phosphatase. So, for example, adrenaline in muscles ends up making you, for an adrenaline rush, you want extra energy, and so you want to make more of this. You want to burn up more energy. And so what happens is adrenaline causes the repression of FBPH2. And so you end up with net production of F2.6, turning on PFK1, and flushing through. Because so much is coming in, everything that's coming in is going right into glycolysis, and since glycolysis is activated, you end up with a ton of energy, and you know you get that racing heart kind of thing that we see. So that's what happens in our cardiac muscles. Now, our skeletal muscles don't have the same level of control. There is really no phosphorylation. They just kind of get more stuff um, and then use it up. Um, but your heart starts to race when you get adrenaline, right? And you can feel that in your chest. Now... For the liver, the liver is at its core a place where we try to export glucose. The glu liver is the store for our body's extra glucose um, that's easily accessible. And so the liver uses glucagon. And this is for liver. Remember our liver is special in a lot of ways. It has glucose 6-phosphatase, which allows us to export our uh, our glucose, we can usually couldn't get out of the hexose monophosphate pool, but in the liver we can, and we can send out glucose uh, into the bloodstream to bring up our blood sugar. Now remember, glucagon is only released if your blood sugar is too low. And so if glucagon is signaling your liver, that should say flush glucose out of your cells. And so glucagon does the opposite. It represses PFK1, and therefore FBPase 2 is winning. Um, sorry, it represses PFK2, and therefore FBPS2 wins. F2.6 is broken down. That fills up our HMP, and that gets flushed out. Now, if we have less 2.6, that means we have a less active PFK1. That means that glycolysis is going to slow way, way down, right? And so that means uh, we're going to have a net flux out of the cell. Also, glucagon helps to favor the breakdown of glycogen. So our glycogen stores are released into the hexose monophosphate pool. It doesn't just it immediately get sucked into glycolysis because this is off, and therefore all the glucose flows out. Stuff flows back through glycolysis in this direction, uh, through making gluconeogenesis, um, and then glycogen breaks down, and all of that stuff fills up the HMP. Hexokinase is repressed because you don't want to keep taking in if you're trying to send out. Or And then the liver, remember, it's glucokinase. That's repressed by G6P, uh, and the net result is everything goes out. So the key thing about 2.6 is that it's a master override. It turns on PFK1. If it's around, if it's not around, everything is repressed. So that helps kind of explain this. PFK2 is a major node for, adre uh, for ad endocrine control of body's uh, response to glucose. Glucagon, remember, means send out. Adrenaline means take in. And we have opposite effects by repressing either PFK2 or FBPS2. So I hope that helps.